open your Bibles, we're going to look at 2 Chronicles, the story of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was known as a king of reformation. He was a reformation king in Israel. But notice, it's found, his story is found in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles, because that's where we're going to look at the story a little closer. 2 Chronicles, and their chapters 29 through 32. Chronicles, Second Chronicles, that little book that we seldom look at, Second Chronicles. All right, so looking at the story of King Hezekiah, what was happening? A reformation starts with an acknowledgement of the true God which changes our worship. Do you agree with that statement? Think a little and tell me if you think you agree. Reformation starts with an acknowledgement of the true God which changes our worship. Okay, let's look at it a little differently, a little more personally. Reformation starts with an acknowledgement that I am not God, which changes my focus, and therefore my worship. So, if I am a little bit too focused on self, then I'm actually worshiping myself. In other words, I'm God. I see myself as God when my focus is too much on myself. And so Reformation starts when I acknowledge that I'm not God. He is God, as we said. He's the true God, and that changes my worship and my focus. Make sense? It rearranges my priorities. What is important for me, or was important, is no longer important. And what wasn't important is now very important, because God rearranges my priorities. Have you ever wondered how much our society and our environment pushes us or squeezes us into its mold? Like Romans 12 says in the in the Phillips translation. Don't let the world, verse 2, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. We can't help it. It happens so, so, so subtly. We are influenced by the politics of the day. We listen to certain radio stations. We listen, look at certain TV stations. Some only look at Fox. Others only look at CNN. And we get a certain bias within ourselves. And we are influenced Influenced, influenced, influenced. And our priorities are sometimes subtly aligned with our environment and our culture and our society. And we don't realize that we are actually cultural Christians instead of heavenly Christians, God's people that have their culture, find their culture and in the Word and find their society in the Word and the principles of God's Word that guides us. And it's so easy to become just so part of society that I live myself out in what's happening in the newspapers or on the news instead of in God's Word. So let's see, let's see if, um, how this happened in Hezekiah's life. Hezekiah, king, as you know, there were all kinds of kings. His dad before him, a wicked king. His son after him, Manasseh, a wicked king. But God calls Hezekiah and says, listen, King Hezekiah, if you are true to me, I will bless you. If you turn away from the sins of your father, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. I mean, this father of his was a bad guy, King Ahaz. Um, he did all kinds of bad stuff. It was during the time of the Assyrian kings of Shalmaneser and his successor, Sargon II, uh, who took the northern kingdom captive. Uh, later, Sargon's son, Sennacherib, invaded uh, Judah in 701 B.C. And so Isaiah was the main prophet during this time period. But there was all kinds of bad stuff that was happening at this time. So let's have a look and see. What kind of sins are the sins of self? If, remember as we said, I acknowledge God, then I will worship Him. If I do not acknowledge Him and have Him as my 
to rearrange my priorities, then I will worship self. So what kinds of worship is this? What does it look like? The worship of self, which we call pride. Now, don't think for a minute, uh, okay, it's the other guy or the other gal. Think, Lord, where have I been prideful and worshiped self? Um, Worship of possessions. Yes, Pastor Jerry, when you visit Costco, what do you think of? Worship of possessions, greed. What about fame and status? Our society is an, uh, a Hollywood-type status. You know, uh, the singers, the, the heroes out there that uh, have fame and, and, and uh, status. How important is that? The worship of desires, of lust, the type of things that we become addicted to, whether it's food or something as simple as just overeating on a good food. <laughs> we can become addicted to sleep. We can become addicted to anything in this, in, in this planet. So where are my priorities if it's out of balance? How do I deal with the worship of self, possessions, fame, and desires that seem to gain control over my life? If I control them, different. But if they control me, we call them addictions. How do I deal with those things? So that's all part of rearranging my priorities. So how does reformation happen? Let's have a look. Um, firstly there, uh, chapter 30 and there, verse 8 and 11. So turn Second Chronicles chapter 30 and there, verse 8 and 11. And let's see what God is teaching us today. My translation says, do not be stubborn. The uh, Hebrew word there is, uh, your neck is stiff. So stiff-necked is what the Hebrew is saying. Don't be stubborn or stiff-necked as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord, submission to the Lord. Come to his temple, which he has set apart as holy forever, set apart for a holy purpose. Worship the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Worship the Lord. Basically saying, stop worshiping your own self Possessions, fame, desires. Your pride, your greed, your status, your lust. Stop worshiping those things. Come and worship the Lord in his holy temple. Okay? And then he says, so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Um, I remember my Hebrew professor said to me, you know, this word anger is interesting in the Old Testament. The, the Jewish way of thinking is very... Uh, uh, dynamic. They thought in terms of verbs, not nouns or, or, or adjectives as much, but verbs, action-oriented. And so the word anger basically means the blazing or the burning or the redness of the nose. So descriptive, so descriptive. When you get angry, your nose shows. <laughs> I don't know whether the Hebrew nose was, uh, got redder than mine when I get angry. I know my face gets angry, gets red when I get angry. But that's what that word means. Uh, anger means the burning of the nose, that he will turn away from that if you turn to God and worship him. And if you return to the Lord, your relatives, your children, verse 9, uh, You'll be mercifully treated by your captors, and they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. If you return to him, he will not re uh, continue to turn his face from you. And uh, remember God's face. The concept there is if God's face is on you, it's in your favor. If God turns his face away, bad news, bad news, bad news. Okay. And then verse 11 uh, says there, by the way, verse 10 says the runners, then they sent runners out. They didn't have uh, uh, email or uh, texting. They sent runners from town to town throughout Ephraim, Manasseh, the far territory of Zebulun. But most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. Does that indicate a priority? A definite priority. The runners come and they give this message, let's go to the temple, let's return to the Lord. Most of the people's response is, Laughter and making fun of them. Have people made fun of you because you're a Christian? Or because you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? They often did that to me 
I remember when I was a youngster at school in South Africa, I attended the state school for a long time in high school, and uh, they said, oh, who, who, what church are you coming to? Are you coming to church tomorrow, on, uh, or at least uh, on Sunday? No, I go to church on Saturday. What? You're a sect? What are you? What kind of thing? Under which rock did you crawl out of? And uh, I just felt this small, you know. Uh, kind of just probably laughed and said, this guy, he's a bit nuts. What on earth does he worship on Saturday for? Have you been mocked for what you believe? That's the important part. Then it says in verse 11, However, some people from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun, these are kind of outlaying uh, tribes, humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Some laughed, some made fun and mocked, and others decided, I'm going to Jerusalem. But they humbled themselves and then went to Jerusalem. How do I do that? Reformation is a choice. Reformation is a choice. So, Reformation acknowledges our own sin and realizes I need to reform. I need to change. I need God to step in and do something for me. Secondly, Reformation restores and repairs. Let's have a look at that. Chapter 29 and there verse 3. Chapter 29 and there verse, th this verse 3 says, In the first, very first month of the year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. We just come through an amazing process of restoration in our church. The same happened with our uh, restoration. We didn't ask for the pipe to burst and for our uh, hall and kitchen and else, elsewhere passage to be flooded. But it happened, and it gave us a chance to repair and to restore and bring in something new. And so there, verse 3 is, there was a repairing done. The uh, Hebrew word also there means strengthen. Sometimes we need to just strengthen that which is weak. Put in those new strong screws that will strengthen the door. Repair them where they're becoming wobbly and old. Verse 35 of the same chapter, verse 35. Uh, the talks there about an abundance of burnt offerings with liquid offerings and uh, peace offerings. And then it says, So the temple of the Lord was restored to service. The temple of the Lord was restored. What does that say about what happened before that? The doors were shut, hanging on their hinges, dust on everything. Have you been in a place like that? It haven't, hasn't been lived in or used for months and years maybe. The dust and everything just piled on it. And this is probably what the temple looked like. So they whoo, dusted it off. And you see, saw dust flying. And they cleaned it out. The temple of the Lord restored for service. Have a look at 31, chapter 31. And there, verse 1, when the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went all to all the towns of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh, and they smashed all the sacred pillars, cut down uh, the Asherah poles, and uh, removed the pagan shrines and altars. After this, the Israelites returned to their own towns and homes. Now, sometimes we have to... We have to do a smashing job, a breaking job. And that which needs to be smashed and broken down is what? The results of sin and the sinful stuff that happened in the church of God. And so for them, there was all these heathen things that crept in. They smashed or broke all the sacred pillars, these stone pillars, apparently. And they cut down the Asherah poles. What was an Asherah pole? Asherah pole? What was that all about? Asherah was the goddess, a goddess, often referred to as the consort of the uh, pagan god Baal. So you could say that Asherah was the, seen as the wife for the concubine of Baal, the consort of Baal. Um, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 19 and, uh, 18, verse 19, have a look there quickly. Hold your finger here. 1 Kings 18 and there, verse 19. 1 Kings 18 and there, verse 19. 
says, Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel. Who's speaking? Elijah. And there's going to be a contest. And what happens there? Along with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Jezebel had all these prophets that supported this female goddess, Asherah, who was the consort of Baal and 450 prophets of Baal. The two go together. And over here, Hezekiah, in chapter 31, verse 1, is told to go and cut down these Asherah poles and remove or tear down the pagan shrines or high places and altars. Now, these pagan shrines were built on high places. And so he says, go to those high places and break them down, crush them, smash them, take them away. And sometimes God is calling us to do the same. And I'm wondering what kind of things may there be within our midst, within my home, within where we worship that may be regarded so, as such. Reformation restores and repairs. There's a work that needs to be done. Thirdly, Reformation seeks God's purification of our lives. Something needs to happen. That filter has gotten old. It needs to be replaced by a new filter, and it's probably filthy. And a purification needs to happen. So I need to ask the Holy Spirit to help me do that. Chapter 29, and there verse 5. Chapter 29, still in Second Chronicles, and there verse 5, says, He said to them, Listen to me, you Levites. Levites, obviously the ones that worked in the temple service. Purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord. This word purify is the same word as used for holy or make, make holy. Sanctify is to make holy yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord. The God of your ancestors, remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. I think the uh, New King James says all the rubbish. Remove all the defiled or the filth or the rubbish from the sanctuary. What uh, kinds of, I hope we don't have any filth or rubbish in the sanctuary. I do know, I see uh, Barbara smiling, I do know that uh, she has uh, gotten into her new office and has been working on that for some time now, trying to clean things and things get thrown out like crazy and she and Jenny get down into the basement, into the arranging room, the flowers, and they throw things out, you know, that have been gathering dust for a long time. We probably need to do that in many cases. But sometimes, have you noticed, things become so holy because guess what makes them holy? Tradition. Have you noticed that? Tradition makes things holy, and they become untouchable. And so they're hard to throw out. Now, I'm not saying we should throw good things out. Tradition is not a bad thing per se. But we need to always evaluate them against the priorities of the Word of God and say, is this a good thing for the kingdom of God now in this day and age in which we're living? Can we improve? Verse 5, Then the people of Israel heard these requirements. They responded generously. Notice that. What does your Bible say? They, re they responded generously. Any other word for generously in your Bible? Abundantly. I like that. Abundantly. Generously bringing the first share of their grain, the new wine, the olive oil, the honey, and all the produce of the fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. The people, verse 6, who had moved to Judah from, Jerusalem, from Israel, and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle and the sheep and the goats, uh, the tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. Can you imagine that? Um, they didn't have dollar bills. It would have been a smaller heap probably if we used uh, $100 bills, but uh, they piled their goods that they brought as tithe. They began piling them up in late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. Wow! Right through the summer. 
When Hezekiah and his uh, officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people. They said, whoa, this is amazing. Huh. Verse 9, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Hezekiah asked the priests and the Levites. You know what? I have an idea that um, if that happened in our church and I looked at the back of the bulletin and I saw that our tithe had doubled, or our budget had doubled the income. Wow. And Betty, I don't know about you, but I would, I, 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 would, I would be stunned. I would say, wow. What is God doing? What has God done? Verse 10. Azariah, the high priest from the family of Zadok, replied, Since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, they have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. It's just like in the parable of Jesus, you know, when he multiplies the loaves, and there's picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. They had plenty to eat, enough to eat, and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed His people, and all this is left over. Wow. And then uh, Hezekiah ordered that storerooms be built in the temple of the Lord to house all the tithes. Verse 12, the people faithfully brought all the tithes and gifts to the temple. They faithfully so the key word for me here is faithfully. I don't think the Lord is as, as, as happy and as moved by one gift that is huge and then I never pay tithe for the next six months. Now sometimes my income may uh, have to be, you know, work it that way. But if I get regular blessings from God, God wants me to just give that little special gift, that regular tithe, every month or every week, whenever, on a regular basis. Faithfulness is what he's looking for, is what he's looking for. And so that's what happened to uh, Israel when Reformation happened. And then the seventh, Revelation brings forth, Reformation brings forth wholehearted trust and faith in God. Chapter 31 and there 21. 31 and verse 21, in all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God wholeheartedly. As a result, he was very successful or he prospered. He prospered or he was very successful. Success and prospering only comes when I am serious with God about who I worship. If I worship myself, I'm not going to be successful. If I worship God and acknowledge Him, then my whole life becomes an unselfish turning towards Him. And I know that uh, we do have a church family, and I said this at our business meeting just this past week, on Wednesday night, that we have a lot of faithful givers in this church. Praise God. We have a lot of regular, very faithful. The majority of this church are faithful givers, and I praise God for that. doesn't matter how much you get or how little you get. God just expects us to be faithful in the least, in the little, and then He will <laughs> put us in charge of much. Now, I know there's some people that are not giving anything into the, the, the coffers of this church and to God, um, as far as our budget and our tithe is concerned. And I don't judge those people until I've spoken with them and we've talked about it. Because some probably give to Signs of the Times or uh, some of these other institutions, it is written, or 3ABN or so forth. But when it comes to tithe, God says, bring it into my storehouse. Um, and if uh, that's something, then that you need to rethink about, you go rethink about that between you and God because it's your decision between you and God. Um, some folk I know do not pay towards our church budget and it doesn't help when uh, our finance people struggle with stuff in this church. If refor reformation happens, there is an abundance because people are joyful, sin is confessed, I love the Lord, and I am giving toward God, towards God's work. And God uses that, right? 
I don't sit and I say, oh, well, you know, they haven't used that correctly. I'm not going to give. That's their business. That's not on me. God simply says, I need to be a cheerful and a good giver. Chapter 32 and there verse 7 and 8 says, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged or dismayed because of the king of Assyria and his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. This is the perspective that changes. When I change my focus from myself, I'm dead scared to God, and all of a sudden I feel safe. Isn't that true? Have you noticed that? For there is a power far greater on our side. He may have a great army, this guy from the king of Assyria. He may have a great army. But they are merely men. The uh, Hebrew there, literally, they are the arm of flesh. They are the arm of flesh. Um, They are merely men. They are just humans. They're just people. They're just humans. We have the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles for us. Hezekiah's words greatly encourage the people. Do you believe that we have the Lord uh, our God on our side and that he will fight our battles in this church? That he will protect us through whatever lies ahead, no matter how deep and dark and vicious the time of trouble may be or look like? And I'm not underestimating that it probably will be, you know, what lies ahead for us in this planet is probably a still, wow, terrible. But God says, nothing, nothing can take you out of my hand. When you're on my side, I will protect you, and those who are fighting on your side are more than those that are against, against us. Take courage.